Hello, Michigan Realtors, and welcome back to another installment of Letter of the Law. I'm Brian Westron, and today's focus is on contract law, and specifically, electronic transactions. Now, we're discussing this topic because it's something that's brought up often in calls to the legal hotline. Agents often want to know whether or not their clients have a binding agreement when an offer has been accepted via text or some other form of electronic communication. Now, these calls to the hotline typically go something like this. My buyer submitted an offer. The listing agent texted me and told me that the seller had accepted my client's offer and that she would be mailing the final signed purchase agreement later that same day. Two hours later, the listing agent called me back and told me the seller had accepted another offer. Doesn't my client have a binding contract? Now, the answer to this question is no. In order to have a binding contract to purchase real estate, there must be a written contract that is signed by the parties. In order to accept the buyer's offer, the seller must sign that offer, and the signed offer must be delivered back to the buyer. There is no binding contract if the seller's acceptance is never actually delivered to the buyer. Say, for example, that a seller signs a buyer's offer and leaves it sitting on the kitchen table. There is no binding agreement here because the seller's acceptance was not delivered to the buyer. This would be true even if the buyer is told that the signed acceptance is on the seller's kitchen table. These are long-standing contract principles that are, were in no way altered by the law allowing for electronic transactions. The Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. Now, as realtors know, Michigan law does allow for offers, acceptances, and counteroffers to be delivered electronically. Decades ago, before the law expressly allowed for electronic transactions, real estate practitioners would amend purchase agreement forms to provide that binding contracts could be exchanged via fax machines. Since then, the law has thankfully adapted to technology, and new laws have been passed that make it easier to conduct business electronically in Michigan. Now, in Michigan, this law is called the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, or the UETA. It provides that parties to a contract can agree that signatures and or delivery can happen electronically. But that's all that the UETA does. It does not modify traditional contract law or the rules of offer and acceptance. Now, in order to create an enforceable contract electronically, the parties must agree to conduct business electronically, and the parties must actually enter into a binding contract. When deciding whether the parties actually entered into a binding contract electronically, courts will focus on intent. In today's world, parties often conduct preliminary negotiations electronically, for example, by text. Courts must distinguish between these electronic preliminary negotiations and an actual binding contract. In order for there to be a binding contract, first, the method of electronic delivery must be as agreed. Two, the parties must have signed the contract, and three, it cannot appear that the parties intended to follow up with a subsequent written contract. The method of delivery. When the parties have agreed to conduct business electronically, it is not the case that any form of electronic communication is sufficient. The method of delivery should be one that the parties have agreed to use. If the contract is silent as to the method of electronic delivery, the UETA provides that delivery should be made to an information processing system the recipient uses for the purposes of receiving information of the type sent. For most of us, this would be email. Obviously, a party does not want to get into a dispute as to whether they delivered the contract to the other party's correct information processing system. For this reason, we advise parties to agree in writing as to what specific email address will be used. Most purchase agreement forms provide that delivery to the seller shall be in care of the listing agent and that delivery to the buyer shall be in care of the buyer's agent. This is consistent with the rules of offer and acceptance in the case of physical delivery of documents. Now remember that this language does not authorize either agent to enter into a binding agreement on behalf of their respective clients. Two agents texting or emailing back and forth will never create a contract for their clients. Those back and forth emails are negotiations and cannot be used to bind the parties. Electronic Signatures 
Real estate agreements must also be signed by the parties. Under the UETA, parties may agree to use electronic signatures. The UETA provides that the term electronic signature includes any method adopted by a person with an intent to sign. An electronic signature would include, for example, a scanned copy of a handwritten signature. There is also software that can capture a person's handwritten signature and embed it into a document. The term electronic signature also includes a digital signature, which typically does not involve any type of replication of a person's handwritten signature. One question that comes up often is whether the type name at the end of an email message qualifies as an electronic signature. Now, this question has not yet been tested in Michigan courts, but it has been tested in other states. One court in Texas, for example, held that the answer may depend on whether the type name was typed purposefully or generated automatically, like in a signature block. Another court in Texas expressly rejected this distinction, finding that a signature block at the bottom of an email has come to represent what a handwritten signature once represented, a means of identifying the sender, signaling that he or she adopts or stands behind the contents. While a New York court found that the phrase, with kind regards Michael, typed at the end of an email, qualified as an electronic signature because the sender's act of typing this name at the bottom of the email manifested his intention to authenticate. As you can see, different courts are coming up with different ways to address this question. To avoid any uncertainty, if a party wishes to enter into an agreement via email, the email should clearly evidence an intent to sign. For example, by typing the word signature next to the party's name. The intent of the parties and the follow-up contract. We're also often asked whether the parties can enter into an enforceable purchase agreement through an email exchange. It is possible, but the parties would have to satisfy a few conditions to meet the threshold of creating an enforceable contract. The electronic exchange would need to include all the essential terms of the transaction. As previously mentioned, the exchange must include the parties' electronic signatures, and the court must be able to conclude that both parties intended to be bound by the contract set forth in the email exchange. If it appears that the parties expected there to be follow-up agreement drafted, a court is unlikely to conclude that the email exchange created an enforceable agreement. So, for example, if one of the parties indicates in the email exchange that she will have her real estate agent or her lawyer draft up a contract containing the agreed-upon terms, a court will likely conclude that the email exchange alone did not create an enforceable contract. Some final thoughts. It is often the case that agents will, with the consent of their clients, discuss contract terms prior to preparing a written offer or counteroffer. Sometimes these discussions take place electronically via email or text. It's important to remember that these preliminary discussions between agents that take place electronically are no more binding than discussions that take place in person or on the phone. Until the agreement is reduced to writing and signed by both clients, there is no binding contract. Realtors must keep this in mind and make certain that their clients understand this as well. Because a client who's prematurely told that they had a deal when they don't actually have a deal will probably be very unhappy. Well, that wraps up another installment of Letter of the Law. And as always, if you have any questions or would like to suggest a topic for a future video, please send suggestions to the email listed below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.